In terms of the talk, I asked Ryan. So Ryan is someone who I've worked with for, for a number of years. This actually happened in when I was the first time I came across him. We were trying to set up a learning analytics group for society. This was in 2010. And um, unfortunately, as we were looking, thinking we had an original or a unique idea around learning analytics, and I sent a few emails out to a couple of people to join the group, and then Someone said, oh, this looks a little like what these people over here have done in educational data, uh, data mining. And I'm not sure how many of you know, but David Wiley was, was the individual that emailed back. David's well regarded in uh, the open education field. And as a result of that interaction, I had a chance to reach out to Ryan. And I just said, look, you know, I've seen you know, stuff you're doing here. We're putting this together. Do you want to be on an advisory committee? And uh, this is probably one of the biggest things I've learned to appreciate about Ryan. So here he is. He started a new field, and, and he was... Uh, founder in this space, uh, president of the International Educational Data Mining Society, and so he certainly has a lot of space to protect. As Maria clearly described to us, that academics sometimes argue, but uh, Ryan, fortunately for us, doesn't hit that profile quite as well, and so he replied, he says he'd love to help and he'd love to be involved. From there, we've been involved in a, a few papers that we've done together, conversations we've had just about the field. He started the first learning analytics course when he was at uh, Teachers College. He's now recently moved over to Initiate Lab at UPenn, also looking at learning analytics. So it's really a, a great pleasure to uh, spend some time with Ryan. Certainly one of the most informed, best connected, and uh, brightest folks in our field. So Ryan, I'll throw it over to you. Too kind. Thank you, George. And thank you all for coming. Um, thanks for in, uh, attending our joint pair of talks. Um, I actually, uh, I guess it's a smaller portion of my life ago, so I actually remember when uh, we first started talking about academic squabble. I remember we had just finished a book on Marie Curie, and Maria, you asked me, like, was Marie Curie a greater scientist than Edward Einstein? And we started talking about well, things that make someone a greater scientist or not, and that's where the idea for the game came from. And, uh, you know, Marie Curie being her favorite scientist, of course, is the most powerful card in the game. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, yes. So this talk about engagement and success in online learning, higher ed and beyond. Uh, so I'm in trouble. How do you follow a talk like that? Uh, so I'll start with a joke. Maria said to me uh, a few weeks ago, I'm nervous with my talk. How do you avoid getting butterflies in your stomach? And Chico said, <laughs> I think you guys are going to go on a campus tour. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, whenever you're ready. Chico, are you ready for a campus tour? Chico said he was ready. Right. I'll see you guys in a little bit. And thanks to the campus two coordinators. Yes. <laughs> did you need a cookie? Yeah, you did. Do you need water? Because it's going to be a little warm outside. Yeah, let's see. Let's go. Thanks, guys. Past experience has, has, has indicated that it is possible to give a talk with Chico in the audience, but it's challenging. He's a good guy. He likes to be involved. Thank you all. Um, okay, so thank you for welcoming me here today. It's a great honor to have a second opportunity to speak at one of the world's great centers for research on online learning. Uh, in my last visit here, I discussed our work to model affect and disengagement from automated detectors built through educational data mining and how our detectors can detect constructs in middle school that produced college attendance several years later. So I can't do that again. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to give the same talk every time, so I'm lucky I at least have two talks worth of material. Uh, this time I'm going to tell you about some of our work to study how engagement in online learning corresponds to success in higher ed and to learners' careers. Um, talk about this in the context of massive online open courses, MOOCs, uh, a term I believe coined by and uh, the first groundbreaking work done in this area by George in the back and other online courses. In these courses, disengagement is a problem. 
For example, most students who register for a MOOC don't complete it. Now, there's currently some people in that population who never intended to complete it, some who never really were interested in the subject at all. Because, for example, you know, you open your email, it's Coursera saying, hey, there's this great new course. The way to find out about this course is to click the link to register. Then you find out, oh my gosh, this involves tensor factorization, and I can't do algebra. Um, so our research questions, though, are can we determine which forms of engagement matter more so we can provide predictive analytics to instructors about the behaviors that matter? And when I talk about success and failure and things like that, I'm not just talking about do they complete the MOOC, because that's such a small part of it. Um, Is it okay to ask some questions in the group? Yeah, go for it. Go for it, please. By any chance, what percentage of the people registering for those hours actually complete their courses? It's pretty small. It varies by the MOOC, but it's, uh, depending on the course, between 1 and 15 percent. Wow. Um, again, we don't really know what percentage of those actually have any real interest in the subject at all, because it's so easy to enroll and register. Anyways, I think of completion, as I'll tell you today, I think completion is important. I actually think it's more important than I thought a year ago. I've really changed my mind on that, but I still think it's not the be all and end all. So, in online courses, there's been considerable work trying to determine which factors lead to student success in online courses. A lot of the published work uses demographics as predictors. We talked about that a little this morning. Demographics are important, but they're not ideal for use in predictive models driving intervention. It's hard to take rapid action to address them compared to behavioral or engagement-based predictors. Just to give an example, we know the people whose parents have never, who have never gone to college are less likely to go to college. But you can't say to a 16-year-old, hey, you're less likely to go to college uh, because your parents have never been to college. Tell them to get on that real fast. <laughs> um, there's also been insufficient exploration of when to use indicators. Does homework not done yet mean the same thing at different points in the semester? Context of the first work I'll talk about, I'll talk about two projects. This is the first of two, is the Sumo online learning platform. Who here's heard of Sumo? One person. Sumo is used by large online universities both for profit and non profits. I actually can't say which ones by, a, by an agreement, and I can't say the context of the research I'll talk, be talking about today, especially because I'm being streamed to the planet. Um, goal is to predict early in the course which students are at risk of not obtaining a passing grade uh, using actionable indicators that can be easily understood by instructors and administrators. So if we put together a really complex recurrent neural network, it does an amazing job of predicting who passes the class, and then tell the instructor, if there's a class, this student won't pass by our incredibly uninspectable, uninterpretable, incomprehensible model. They go, great, what do I do about it? This is what we're talking about 4,000 students, small data sets for these days. And going back to talking about history, which George was doing earlier, I remember the first time I gave a talk at a conference on EDM kind of stuff, it was 2004, and I said, we had 70 students who contributed. 40,000 points of data, and everyone went, ooh. <laughs> and nowadays, if I were to give a talk at EDM or LAC, uh, and I'd say, I had 70 students, it, I, I might get laughed out of the room. So we had a, yeah, we had a modest data set, 4,000 students, US history, private nonprofit, 2.1 million interactions in the system. Goal, predict who gets a C or better. Why a C rather than an F? Because if students get C's at this place, they don't get financial aid anymore. That's an important thing. Financial aid is a big determiner of who's going to stay in college. <laughs> About three quarters of the students did get a C or better. So students, so our findings, first of all, students who have not yet opened the text, the online text before the class starts, have almost a 50% chance of getting a D or an F. It's called the predict, uh, precision metric. So. It's amazing to me, and this is kind of cool, it's kind of surprising, that on day one of the course, not using like past courses, not using demographics, we can still tell half the time if they're going to get a DRF. Now, is this going to be applicable in courses where students don't even find out about the online textbooks in the first day? No. It's going to be a different indicator. And actually, in ongoing work with Lalitha Atiyatri at McGraw Hill, we're actually finding that day 14 is the really important uh, day in those courses. That turns out to be day 14 is the day where you either where your free trial on the textbook ends. So, and people, uh, whether, yeah. So, again, there are a lot of these things that are in the design of the system that actually matter. In this course, where they had access to the textbook in advance, 50% of the time, if they haven't opened the textbook before the class starts, they're going to get a DRF. 
And this indicator captures 70 percent of the students will get a DRF. Recall. So this for this course for this university it's really important and really simple. Uh, the same indicator has the student up on the textbook yet remains predictive one week after the class starts, but with very different metrics. At that point, almost 80 percent of the students who haven't opened the textbook yet by the end of the first week will get a DRF. But only 20% of the students will get a DRF haven't opened the textbook yet. So the precision has gone way up, the recall has gone way down. Just seven days later, exact same metric. This is important because a lot of papers treat the issue of when their metrics are calculated kind of a little bit haphazardly, right? You have a lot of papers where it's one week, you have a lot of papers where it's three weeks or four weeks. And these things really, these timing issues really matter. In fact, you can actually draw the precision recall trade off from, ooh, that didn't work. Uh, you can draw the precision recall trade-off from what day into the course you are. The, the proportion of people who are going to do badly, uh, count crossed with uh, how many of people are going to do badly you catch, changes pretty substantially over the, over the first, uh, from day negative seven to day 14. So, again, poor performance on early, another finding, poor performance on early assignments is very predictive. Half the students who get below a C on the first assignment get a DRF for the class in this course. Half the students who get a DRF for the class get below a C on the first assignment. Another very early indicator. So, okay, uh, the student has opened their textbook. How do they do on the first assignment? Again, these are things that an instructor can actually talk to the student about. They can say, hey, you haven't opened the textbook yet. Hey, you bombed the first assignment. Let's talk. Again, the precision recall trade-off. In this case, how strict, how good a grade do you want? Do you care if they get a 50% or a 95%? And the precision recall are going to trade off on this. Again, a lot of papers just kind of give some arbitrary cutoff, right? Um, we're really trying to pick the best point, but just trying to pick the point that's kind of got the best precision and the best recall average. Well, it, it's almost arbitrary where on this is, right? One of these might be a little better, but what you see is there's this really strong trade-off. So you want to catch those trade-offs. You want to think in your modeling in terms of those trade-offs. Maybe the big takeaway message from this first half of the talk is a lot of this kind of I've got a magic box kind of data mining doesn't help you think about the kind of trade-offs you've got when you're actually building the features you're going to make predictions based on. This gets these issues we talked about this morning about feature engineering. In conclusion, early indicators can be very powerful, even if they're very simple. In fact, simple is better in one core way. And that's kind of a movement, you know, I started in the framework of let's get away from simple indicators, let's make fancy data mine models. We want data mine models where they're based on indicators we can really think about, because that's what people can take action on. I just dropped a quick comment in there, just get some feedback from you, I guess. One of the interesting things that came from the medical diagnosis and the doctors particularly diagnosed, there's a question, this gets the idea of early indicators. Uh, they found that the doctors who made the biggest impact and the most accurate um, assessments over time were the ones who created an early diagnosis but held it loosely to generate additional information. Whereas doctors who waited and waited and waited until they had all the information and then made a decision were actually far worse than accurate uh, assessment of the patient. So, it seems like there's a little bit of that going on here is, is uh, do something early, but What's your feedback loop then, I guess, to ensure that the early indicators continue to be robust? I think that's really important. That's a great point. I hadn't heard that specific result, but I think you'll see that in models that accumulate evidence over time that you really, you want to take action relatively early, especially for some of these things, but you clearly want to take gentler action if the student, if the student hasn't opened the textbook on the first day of class, you want to take gentler action than if they haven't opened it on the 14th, right? One of those situations is a situation where they are at serious risk, but it's still very intervenable. The other one is you're almost out. I agree with that point. The med I should, you know, I feel like we all should know more about the medical diagnosis literature because it's so absolutely important. And we have a lot of problems in our field because people tend to believe that medical diagnostics are perfect and that ours are incredibly flawed. And so we'll see numbers for our models and they'll say, oh, that's useless. You see this with grant reviews a lot. Journal editor, journal reviewers as well. And we have numbers that are better often than widely used medical tests. Example one, Ebola. Everyone's familiar with the Ebola crisis. If you look at published reports, I, at the time of the crisis, I haven't looked in the last six months. At the time of the crisis, there were no published papers on the diagnostic metrics of the test being used for Ebola. 
There were so many reports. Okay, I, I talked to you, Jerry. That you knew that the metrics were not good. Not only that, Lyme disease. If anybody in this room ever thinks they might have Lyme disease, and the doctor says, you need a test, it's negative. Do not trust it. Test for Lyme disease is not only sliding things. Test for Lyme disease is completely unreliable in terms of recall in the first two weeks after infection. Like, it's got, it's got an area under the RFC. Oh, okay, she can do it. Okay. So, in fact, it's actually, like, around 0.5. So, um, and it gets very reliable, like triple nines, like after eight weeks or so. Um, and then they can take That's one of those cases where you have a test, there's a curve, precision recall curve, maybe on what day that. you do that. Thanks. And people tend to trust the overall number that you see, and they don't look at uh, that fact. So, the bottom line is that medical diagnosis, not even all the practitioners using that understand the tests they're using. We have to do better. We have to make sure we understand the tests we're using, what the properties are. Great opportunity to let me ramble, George. Thank you. No problem. I, I, and I, you're absolutely right. I'm really surprised because the academic or uh, the medical literature is often held up as an example of being student learning, right? Diagnose properly, feedback, tracking students, and so on. And yet, the point that you just raised about the uncertainty that's affiliated with that, you don't hear that second half of that. When you get a test back from the doctor, they don't tell you the precision recall statistics um, or the errors on that diagnosis for the period of time when it was given. And some measures are really good medicine. Anything involving DNA, PCR, or RNA, uh, PCR after 14 days is essentially six months. But not all medical tests, uh, not all diseases can, can you apply those kind of tests on, especially not stuff that's non-pathogen uh, non based. <coughs> So, any other questions about this first half? By the way, I did talk to Ryan, and he said it was fine if you guys sort of drop in and ask questions. And stuff. <laughs> uh, don't feel we have to wait till the end. Any catches your interest, or even if you're unclear, Ryan's a, a trivia instructor, and no one will laugh if you're asking a question. You're too kind, George, and I do want to say I really love questions, and I love discussion because I, that's how I learn. It's passive talking, I don't learn it from my phone. So predicting success in MOOCs. So this was conducted in the context of big data and education. Uh, the MOOC I taught, uh, it's now been through two iterations and we'll be doing a third soonish. Um, exact data is to be determined because right now we're in the middle of having talks between Columbia and Penn on the sharing of source materials and issues like branding and things we're gonna have to figure out. Um, so yeah, so core staff, me as instructor, L. Wang, uh, also part of Interlab as a teaching assistant, and Luke Paquette, head community TA, now uh, faculty at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, great honor to have had a chance to work with Luke during um, that phase of his career. Our second iteration, our first iteration was just a Coursera course, regular, no modifications. Our second iteration had intelligent tutor-based assignments in CTAP, the Cognitive Tutor Authoring Tools, by Vincent Olaven. Collaborative chat activities in Bazaar, Carol and Rose's tool, tool walkthroughs, and enhanced lectures, which is my fancy way of saying I had some mistakes and I fixed them. <laughs> Thanks to people like uh, uh, Radek Pelinek, who found a, a pretty a big whopper in my, in my thinking. Key components in our first iteration, and in the second one, videos, assignments, discussion forums, self-organized study groups on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, first iteration, 48,000 students the official course end, uh, about 12,000 who actually ever did anything at all on the course. Um, over 106 different languages spoken, which is kind of awesome. And a common research question about MOOCs like this one is, why do so few people complete them? So we talked about this at the beginning. I think there have now been somewhere well into the hundreds of articles on the subject in just the last three years. Partial answer from Kizilchuk, most students who join a MOOC never have a goal of completing. They want to learn uh, some of the material or browse in a new area or many other potential motivations. In fact, I had a student come up to me last year, I think it was, and say, Ryan, thanks to your MOOC, I watched one video. I learned the topic. I wrote a paper on it. It got published. It was published in AI and Ed. That is a great victory, right? And anybody who says that completion is the only thing that matters, well, that student clearly uh, was a success for us. I'm not going to call that a failure. 
Margaret's research question then is a little, a little more complicated. It's what aspects of MOOC participation predict long-term participation in the community of practice? And I would add now, having written this slide a little while ago, I'd add it in a beneficial way. So in this context, what characterizes the learners who choose to participate in the educational data mining community after taking the MOOC? We operationalize this in two ways. First, a relatively basic one, did you join the scientific society? It's like $20 to join or you get a membership for free if you attend the conference. Second one, submitting a paper to the educational data mining conference or the LAC conference. You know, if you submit a paper, that's really showing uh, intent, intense desire to participate. You could say, well, maybe it should be people who got pub that paper published, right? But I mean, that's a higher bar. Um, and then as, you know, as those of you who have published extensively here in this room know, there's a bit of a crapshoot, even in small, well-run conferences like EDM or LAC. Uh, this year, uh, the paper at EDM, the paper that I submitted that I was most excited about got rejected, and the paper I was least excited about got accepted as a full. And also, the paper last year, of all the papers that I submitted last year that I was most excited about, got hard rejected from ACM Learning at scale. So, there's either I have terrible judge judgment in my own work, or uh, or there's a crapshoot going on. Possibly both. We did two rounds of analysis on this data. The first round was in summer 2014, and it was data on who had joined the society during the course or in the first months after the course. And the round two was data on who joined the society so far and who submitted a paper in 2014 or 2015. Yes, sir. Which one? I um, am, I was at the time the president of the society. And so uh, all the uh, all the names came past me. And you may say, what did you do on anonymity and such like that? The actual way we worked out the IRB was that L. Wang did all the analyses, and I de-identified the data and passed it to her. That's actually how we've always done this, is I've been, as the course developer, I have not actually done the analyses. I have done all the making of data sets, and other people have done the analysis. So initial finding, in 2014, Elle found that 35 students had joined the EDM Society during or in the first several months after the class, out of a total membership of 244, so really I should have made a cut off this. 20% um, of the students who joined the Society completed the course, 1.3% of the remaining students completed the course. In other words, joining the Society, I'm uh, sorry, completing the course is a strong sign that you're, that you're motivated, right? Now, does this mean that, join, that completing the course caused you to join the society? No. Correlation is not causation. But it's an indicator that completion is a strong indicator of motivation, which makes sense. That, that's what we've known. But it shows that we, the skepticism that I had initially about com course completion, well, course completion does matter. It is an indicator of things that matter at minimum. So course completion may not be the only thing that matters, but it's a, clearly a strong indicator of investment in the topic area. The second round of findings, 48 students joined the EDM Society, so that's 13 more. And 148 students submitted papers to one of the conferences after the class. <laughs> now, I'm surprised by it. I was surprised by this. Because I thought that the easy one was going to be paying $20, and the hard one was going to be putting weeks of your life into writing a paper, but apparently I'm wrong. Apparently $20 is a bigger deal than weeks of your life. I guess the people who did Mechanical Turk did this long before me. So, both society joiners, this is the paper, by the way, that got rejected from ACM Learning at Scale, and that we're, um, we've resubmitted it to a journal. Both society joiners and paper submitters watched more lecture videos, submitted more assignments, read the forums more often, and read the course syllabus more often, but they don't post more to the forums, respond more to posts, or rate posts more often. Or in other words, it's the workers who are more likely to uh, join the society and submit papers. Like the people who spend all their time on the forum posting and posting and posting, whether it be on topic, they're talking about the assignments, or the videos, or about the color of my shirt. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, they weren't the ones who joined. Uh, they weren't the ones who could submit papers and join. This was a surprise to me. I've always thought of lurking as kind of a not very, you know, not supposed to lurk, but apparently the people who spend their time learning are, are more the people who publish than the people who spend their time uh, posting. 
leaving this says about all of our focus in education today, social learning, and what we're doing, because we are suggesting there, at least for the pedagogical model as Evan moves, what you're suggesting is that those things are actually critical. I would want to replicate uh, this in MOOCs that are not quite as professionally oriented before I draw a strong conclusion. BD MOOC is a weird MOOC. Um, however, and I'll talk about this at the end, we are working towards replicating this um, in our replication project, which I'm not sure if I have slides on, but I'll talk about at the end no matter what. So in other words, let's wait and see. But certainly it is, and you know, I know George, you've been a big advocate of that viewpoint, it certainly is a challenge to that viewpoint that the active engagement there's one other issue that I want to point out, which is that we haven't distinguished what the posts are about from the content. We really need to do that, too, before we draw any real conclusions, because it might be that there's a lot of people making a lot of junk posts, and they're not the ones who publish. Really, that may be is uh, a particular curricular format or pedagogical approach is forced through a technological structure. Social components are actually sort of antithetical. You have to move to different spaces to use just Well, that's a great point. I think Lisa and Andy, but that's a great point because a lot of people went offline. There were a lot of study groups in our MOOC that either took place on other platforms or that took place live. For example, Arizona State actually had a large study group that met every week to talk about all the materials. There were study groups in other cities as well. Well, yeah, I just, I mean, just I had an experience like. I've never completed a single MOOC, but it, it depends on how they, you know, if all the information is already there and I don't have to like wait to get it, I'm like a, a worker who's going to go, I use it like a book. Yeah. To me, it's a book that I'm going to read, gather the information and move on. And I think that those sometimes are just more serious people that are getting the information and they just don't want to, they see those kind of these posting things as just, I don't have time for that. Well, and that might have been especially, especially the case in this course where there were a lot of adult professional learners who were already graduate students in, in their careers. That, that's, this was a very atypical MOOC in some ways, although in some ways I think the MOOCs that have been most successful while have, have had this characteristic. Um, also, on the, care, on the thing about books, you know, I've had a lot of publishers approach me and say, Ryan, write a book on this. We'd love to publish your book. And I think to myself, the MOOCs I've been involved in have had 100,000 people, uh, you know, register about approximately, and probably somewhere in the ballpark of 20,000 people to 25,000 people participate. There's no way that any book I would write on educational data mining would have 25,000 people even open the cover. You know, it's a different dissemination model. Andy. The points we're in discussion in this class, they were my point. Nope, there were no points for the discussion. Okay. Which books have been successful? Well, I mean, it on your definition of success. What would be your definition of success? Well, you have more or more or you know, and in terms of complete, higher, you see higher completion rates, mm -hmm. in, to my knowledge, in two types of MOOCs. Very general knowledge, general purpose ones, where anyone can do it, and very, very specialized hard ones, where it's very clear selection. You know, if you have a MOOC on advanced particle physics, only people who already know some physics are, very, are likely to take that. So those are the two extremes where you get a lot of completion. In terms of life impact, there's been very little documentation of life impact for any MOOCs. Uh, Coursera put out a thing where they had people self-report that it benefited their lives, that was very vague. To my knowledge, and there might be something I don't know about because there have been so many papers, the only MOOCs I know of documentation of actual life impact our, our MOOC, where we have a submitted paper, and I'll talk, I've given a few talks, and there was a paper this year uh, from a group at TU Delft that showed for programming MOOCs that people were learning programming structures that then got incorporated on their code on GitHub. And those are the only, and I believe they also did some LinkedIn work with that. But those are the only examples I know of. It doesn't mean it's not out there, but I think is that people have been very slow to document any success beyond completion rates. And completion rates, given that so much of it is driven by how many people spuriously enroll, I just, you know, yeah, I, I feel like that's not a very good metric at the moment. We have to think more deeply about it. I would, I would think that also when you look at time for a student, 
guided by a profession who has a lot of credits in See, that's something interesting with mean, groups that uh, have <coughs> personality that is not um, I'm not going to this book extensively at books, and it's one of the biggest books that are developed for artists in Rome actually don't necessarily have very huge prestigious faculty prior to this. It's not going to be on how to learn that's going to be called Sarah's has to be on the students. So I think it's always difficult. Well, success. What is success? Um, but that's a very, very thin layer of success. I think it means it's the most, the least valuable measure of success. Because people use it for different reasons. There's quite a bit of literature that looks at why people take it. Even the companies like edX now have stopped including in their completion metrics people who signed up but never did it. And that can use them to see five plus. So success is quite a different thing. And that's the mindset that I'm trying to articulate is that the cult of personality, what success means. When we're doing research in digital environments and learning context, it's important that we evaluate the baggage so that we have accurate in a physical space, but not accurate. And uh, I in particular, I actually think one of the other reasons why completion, although completions correlate with stuff that matters, right? One of the reasons why I think completion is a pillar is I actually think MOOCs are more like the next version of a textbook than the next version of a course. I think when we think about them that way, and I look at how so many of the people who got a lot out of my MOOC were, were actually created study groups. They kind of created their own courses around it. Um, it's complicated. Uh, we haven't got a good model. We're still thinking about these in a 1990s framework, and they're not, and they're a new, uh, they're a new thing. So, you use my course to do a message in terms of putting, uh, you use other courses to write with your own results. You have to do that often. You use other courses to write with your own results. Not yet, but soon. At the end, uh, I will. If I, I can't remember if I have slides or not, but at the end, I will talk about a replication project, and I plan to answer your question. Then. Bother me if I don't. Bug me if I forget about this. Bug me. It's important. This is one MOOC, and it's an unusual one. What's nice about this MOOC, though, is there are very few MOOCs where there's such a clear criterion of impacted career as submitting a scientific paper. There's very few MOOCs that lend themselves to that as nicely as this one, which is one reason why we picked this one. To study, rather, you know, aside from the fact that we have data handy, but it, it, but I think it's there's very few that have such clear criteria, uh, clear evidence of career advancement. So people who submit a paper are ten times more likely to have completed than non-submitters. Same thing as before, as the early one, as with uh, society joiners, which we kind of replicated again with the bigger sample. Future work. Study social media participation during the course as a predictor of future career participation. Maybe the discussion columns would have, uh, you know, weren't where the really important social interaction was happening. Future work, follow these learners for in their career. So uh, we're collaborating with some people at TU Delft to, uh, in the next few months, start using LinkedIn data to see who appears to have had career changes that were benefited by this one. <laughs> Again, correlational, not causal. We're talking temporal correlation, but Somebody might have decided to make a change and then taken this MOOC to, 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 to help them with it. So what predicts completion? Things like first week assignment performance, downloading more videos. These are seen in other MOOCs. This is nothing shockingly new. Um, some of this stuff is a little new. More posts. So despite the fact that posting isn't correlated with the long-term career accomplishments, it is correlated with completion. Um, shorter posts, interestingly. People who ramble like crazy are less likely to complete the course than people who ask focused, targeted questions or make reasonable responses. Linguistically more concrete posts, linguistically more cohesive posts, posting in the same thread as other students who complete the course. Uh, Google at NC State showed that you actually get clicks in this course. There are people who talk to each other on the forums who complete, and people who talk to each other on the forums who don't complete. They're talking about very different things, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, and so you could ask that question about, you know, is the, we've done all the MOOCs. Part of the reason why we hadn't done it until very recently 
is because we didn't have data from other MOOCs. We've actually been able to get some data. In fact, a lot of people have come to us for our data because we have a data set. We've been able to partner with people, and we've got our data set in a decent form. Uh, those of you who've worked with Coursera or edX data before, who's that? It's kind of a mess. edX is a lot better than Coursera. Um, John, if you want to, if you want to to cry or or feel great admiration for some of these great efforts, read uh, John Whitmer's guide to uh, working with Coursera data. It is a a Herculean, if not Sisyphean, endeavor. <laughs> what else predicts completion? Well, L did some surveys. Here's another fun one. If a student says, I am going to complete this course, but they have a low grit, according to Angela Duckworth's survey of grit, they're less likely to complete the course than students who say, I am not going to complete this course. I don't care about completing this course, but they have high grit. I thought that was a kind of a neat connection to the grit literature. So we're using the, the instrument developed by Angela Duckworth, uh, which is a self-reported instrument. Uh, it's been used in populations from kids doing spelling bees to army cadets to uh, ad adults. It's pretty short. It's like, I think, 12 items with a short grid scale. But it's predicted uh, life success in a lot of areas. And we're just using Angela Duckworth's uh, instrument here. And I thought it was kind of cool that that instrument, you know, I thought it was kind of cool that instrument is, so, is, be is better prediction of completion than whether you say you want to complete. Like, it's kind of paradoxical, right? That somebody says, I have no intention of completing. I don't care about completing. But they, but they tend to stick to stuff they start in general. And that's a better predictor. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I would not have predicted that, by the way. I mean, I'm a fan of the grip measure, but I would have figured that the people who say they're going to complete are relatively likely to complete. So, or at least I might have even bought this half, but I don't think I would have bought this half, if that makes sense. So future work, integrate models of different information. Do some types of information about learning better predict the learning outcome than others? And what combinations of features are most powerful? Uh, also, do our intelligent tutor-style assignments give us additional information about learners compared to the traditional quiz-style assignments typically used in edX and Coursera? At some point, we're going to get around to, we've been meeting to do it for about um, a year now, actually applying some of our detectors of gaming a system, intentional misuse of learning environments, to our uh, edX data, to our intelligent tutor data, we just haven't managed to get to it yet. I think that would be really interesting, especially given recent evidence that people uh, go to the trouble of actually doing multi-account answer harvesting to complete this. If anyone's familiar with that, there was a recent paper on this by uh, Wan Li Sheng, um, which found that, I think it was in Dave Pritchard's MOOC at uh, MIT, something, some crazy number, I, I'm gonna get this percentage wrong, but some crazy number, like 25% of learners uh, in that MOOC, had two accounts which they were logging into from the same machine, and they would do this thing where they would um, show answer, show answer, show answer, show answer on the tests, or you know, get or systematic guessing on the tests, get the answers, and then write them all down. We don't know they wrote that. Somehow, magically, then log log out, log in from a different account, and get it all right. Um, that's that never two browsers. Or, yeah, or two browsers. That's another thing I mentioned. Yeah. Or uh, one incognito browser, one other one, but either way, log in on the same computer at the same time and do that. Yeah, that, that, that really devalues the concept of a certificate, right? Mm -hmm. Not to mention that it's just kind of, I don't know. The other thing we've worked on our MOOC is negativity towards the instructor. Verbal abuse of the instructor on forums or other venues. A significant disengaged behavior and a problem in many MOOCs. We saw quite a bit of it during Dom MOOC. Um, BDE had some of this, but actually far less than other courses, where you saw things like threats of violence towards the instructor, sexually violent postings, and hundreds of personal attacks towards the instructors. Um, can be very upsetting to instructors, leading to disengagement from the forums, other disengagement during the courses, not teaching the course again, and stronger negative impacts, including some anecdotal reports of clinical oppression, and one instructor in Switzerland who quit his course in the middle. Well, there might have been other stuff going on uh, in that case as well. In our course, for example, one instructor repeatedly attacked the instructor, me, whenever the instructor posted acknowledging an error or an imperfection in the course. This student is kind of famous. Uh, he's known for doing the same thing in other courses in Coursera and Udacity. I read an example of this student's posting in a talk in Beijing 
And somebody else recognized their writing style and asked if it was them by name. They got it right. Uh, also complaints about the content, the presentation, the assignments, discussion about the instructor's clues and mannerisms. Apple Baker is a dedicated teacher and even records video lectures while incarcerated. <laughs> At least it looked like a jumpsuit, prison jumpsuit in the week seven and eight videos. I have no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have an orange shirt, you don't even think about it, right? But when there's tens of thousands of people well, I mean, this gentleman who posts on my course has used the same ID in several courses, but it, we don't know that's actually his real name. We don't even know it's really a guy. It claimed to be a, he claimed to be a guy from Denmark, but for all I know, it's a woman in the box. Anonymity on the line. Incidentally, if you want to, if you want to truly be creeped out in life, teach a MOOC. Uh, because I had, I got this call on my cell phone one day. It was from a woman in the Bronx who was in my MOOC and wanted to meet me personally. She found my cell phone number uh, through Googling online. <laughs> wow. Not that girl's way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I mean, I also got a sexually explicit response on one of the questionnaires. Um, but compared to what, say, Denise Comer at Duke experienced, Denise got like real harassment on her MOOC. The most thing I had to go report is actually that the, the amount of crap that men get as MOOC instructors, women get like way more. The research shows that like the um, um, end of course and um, evaluation, that women are always evaluated <coughs> and more harshly than men. And oh, oh, it's all every in every country. In general, though, there's the weird phenomenon in live courses of uh, the chili pepper, chili pepper phenomenon, which is to say that how many chili peppers uh, you get uh, on greatmyprofessors.com is positively correlated with uh, course evaluation, and it's stronger for women for men. So, that, but that's not a positive mitigating. That's it's a complex thing, and people are people are problematic, unfortunately. Especially if no one knows who they are. They just... That's right. And there's like a definite on these MOOCs, there's a many to one. Although some of the worst harassment that Denise got in her MOOC was done by somebody who used his own name and publicly acknowledged that harassment. Um, yeah, which was very strange. But yeah, I mean, the, the phenomenon of swatting is another one like that. That's where people like find the home addresses of people they don't like on the internet and send SWAT teams to their house. On thread or yeah, or claim a hostage situation or stuff. No, that's unfortunately a thing. Uh, the game, the Gamergate thing uh, involved that a lot. Yeah, and there, and a couple of people have done that have been arrested, but mostly, uh, especially if it's done across international borders, it's really hard to do anything about that. You have to get both jurisdictions to care. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, the worst I've gotten in my course was a creepy phone call, some creepy emails, and being interrupted in public a few times. Um, but. So in BDE, just nine students out of 48,000 engage in this type of negativity more than once. All male, or at least chose male names. Um, these students were much higher, responded much, they had a much higher response rate than the course average on the pre-course survey, although obviously with a sample of nine, we don't get a statistical significant effect. Um, and they were not notably different from the rest of the class in terms of self efficacy, goal orientation, or other subjects, or other uh, survey responses. This is very much like how many people have been in but they have been One of the things I've argued for, but I haven't got any of the main platforms to agree with me, is I think there should be a, 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 a silence button. And the person would be able to keep posting, but no one would see their posts. Yes. That's sort of, yeah, like you read it. <laughs> I, I, yeah. It's interesting to see that MOOCs haven't done more with it. I think part of the reason is that uh, they're, they're uh, similar to closed. You have to be fairly active in social media in order to get these things to the forefront of the police experience of teaching and be able to share some of that stuff. I, I'm really surprised that edX and course are having to adopt techniques of sites like Flash Dogs and then trying to just silence those voices. 
and I don't. I want to give some props to edX because during during Downlook, George, you may remember that when uh, there were some very negative posts going on during Downlook, that actually the edX uh, core support people got on the forums and uh, were defending uh, us. So I actually, I feel like edX, at least in my experience teaching on both platforms, edX does more than Coursera. So that's that. That would be my perspective. We didn't actually have it the second time I taught, by the way. I don't know if it just uh, made a more serious crowd the second time I taught this. Huh? Um, so I have interest in future work on studying how to support the instructors better when negativity occurs. You know, we had rallying around support, which seemed to help in download. Um I do think whatever we do, we can't just ban because of soft puppetry, you know? Um, <clears throat> So more ongoing work in BDM. Okay, I did have a slide. Excellent. So we've started a project uh, that's linked to the Pledge project, but it's kind of a step on the way to Pledge, and they'll kind of, I think, diverge in some ways. But replicating 21 published findings on MOOCs would be the MOOC data. Um, and I think eight of them replicated, and two of them went in the opposite direction. Um, so this gets to what you're, you were asking about. Um, so the idea is that Miggy, although he's just uh, Miggy Andres, the guy that's been working on us, has replicated 21 published findings, but he's done it by creating an ingestion engine that links to a production system engine, which can test variations on these findings. What's nice about this is we can now pump through a lot of data from a lot of MOOCs now that we've built this framework and put in more findings. It's uh, a framework for further replication of published findings on the MOOC data. And it's a first step to it as a general pledge framework that can automatically identify at-risk students and determine how to effectively intervene. We're now working on the next step of it, which is that in collaboration with Erica Snow at SRI, we're coming up with possible uh, interventions for these uh, based on these models, and we'll be testing some of those interventions in future MOOCs uh, to try to help build the pledge framework that can integrate data, pull in data, um, and do effective things in response to it. Uh, Part of the idea of building this framework also is that we can start to move beyond saying which findings replicate, but saying which findings hold for which students in which contexts. So this is just the very start of it. We have, fortunately, a couple of really good data resources for this, which is that um, I'll be working at Penn now, and Penn is, I think, the fifth biggest provider of uh, MOOCs in the, in the world, and I'll be working with some of the Penn data to try to extend this model, and uh, we'll be working uh, in our roles at Edinburgh, Dragon Gas, which is group, and Edinburgh is another really big MOOC provider. So that'll be a really nice opportunity to test these things. Again, with the idea of creating a framework that will actually help us figure out why is a student at risk um, and what can we do about it. The Pledge is a big project. There's a lot to it, and uh, if you're interested in learning more, see George and Dragon and my talk about it at EDM last year. There's a lot of moving pieces to creating a universalized framework that can connect between all these different platforms and give ideas of how to intervene to help students exist. So conclusions on this part. BD MOOC has been an opportunity to share research and methods for learning analytics and educational data mining with a wider audience. It's also provided a data set that we've been able to use for a range of analyses. Uh, some bigger themes, engagement manifests in a large variety of ways in online learning. We can detect and track engagement and engagement matters for long-term student outcomes. So uh, I think everybody here knows about it, but just in case you don't, we have a Twitter feed where we publish all our latest scientific results. Everything else, Google me to get all our papers. Um, I'm not the uh, CBS News anchor in Chicago, nor am I the football player. So thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to chat more.